All right, guys, go ahead and grab a seat if you would. Hey, today we're kicking off a new series that we're calling Gifted. Over these next five weeks, we're going to be talking about what is the Bible, specifically in the book of 1 Corinthians, has to say about the topic of spiritual gifts. And maybe that's something that you've, you've heard about before, studied before, or, or maybe this is the first time you've ever thought about this. But, but if you're a follower of Jesus, at the moment you gave your life to Christ, the Holy Spirit of God came and lived in, to live inside of you. And one of the things the Holy Spirit does is He gives everyone who's following Jesus, He gives us all gifts and abilities that, that He has imparted to us supernaturally that He wants us to use to make a difference with our lives. And so we're going to be talking about this over these next five weeks. On Thursday nights, for people that, that would like a, a little more detail, kind of go a little deeper, we're going to be going to be a Bible study. Thursday night at 7.15 for the next five weeks to go alongside with this topic. It's going to be over at the Double Diamond Campus. Pastor Tom's going to be doing that. It's going to be awesome. There's going to be child care there if you, uh, that I believe is like five bucks a kid, unless, unless your kid's poorly behaved, at which point it's $15 a kid. And so, uh, so let's see what the Bible has to say. Go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. So good. Not... Whatever. And so, uh, 1 Corinthians 12. I'm glad you guys were awake this morning. I was concerned last night that it might be a, you might be subdued. So I'm proud of you for not staying up too late. 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 1. Uh, it says, Now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be uninformed. I don't want other translations that I do not want you to be ignorant. So we see here from the Apostle Paul that it is important to know about spiritual gifts. Uh, and so what Paul's going to do in 1 Corinthians is he's going to take about three chapters that right in the middle uh, towards the end of this book, 12, 13, and 14. And Paul is going to really unpack this idea of spiritual gifts because many people make mistakes when it comes to spiritual gifts. There's really kind of two extremes. Some people don't pay enough attention to spiritual gifts. Some people pay too much attention. Some people end up um, overemphasizing their own gifts and it don't ends up bringing division. That's what was happening at the church at Corinth. They, they were a super gifted church and there was a lot of great things about it, but they weren't, they weren't all using their gifts the right way and it had gotten kind of nutty. And, and so Paul spends these three chapters in 1 Corinthians trying to give them instruction of here's how it's supposed to go. Here's how, why God gave you these gifts. And, and in the New Testament, we see tons of, of different, a bunch of different spiritual gifts referenced or listed. And uh, we're going to kind of walk through some of these. Now, now, most theologians believe that there's even more gifts than the ones listed in the New Testament. But, but here's a sampling. Let me just, just kind of give you a snapshot. So there's the gift of administration. Have you ever known somebody who, who just seems like man, God uses them just to get stuff done? Ever known someone like that? I think about Scott Rona, who's our pastor of administration. When, when he walks in a place, things begin to happen, uh, uh, to get stuff done. Uh, kind of a, an apostolic type of gift. God gifts some people for, that, that are really great at getting things started. Many times, starting new churches, they, they, they kind of have a, a, a supernatural, entrepreneurial kind of a gift, an apostolic kind of a gift, a gift of discernment. God, God gifts some people that, that just, in a certain scenario, that they seem to have insight into what God is doing. And sometimes there are things where, where maybe a teaching will come. And, and maybe it's unclear as to if, is this really from the Lord or is maybe this a little bit off. And, and many times someone with the gift of discernment will have real insight saying, I, I believe this is from the Lord or this might be out of balance. A, a gift of evangelism. Now, every one of us, the Great Commission to go and make disciples for us to point people to Jesus, that's for all of us. But some people have this kind of supernatural gift of evangelism where, where, where they just love to share their faith. They're really good at it. And when they do, many times people come to faith more often. Have you ever known anyone like that? That, that man, I, I had a pastor who, who, who was a pastor, and he realized I'm really more of an evangelist. And, and everywhere he goes, he tells people about 
about Jesus, and people are always coming to faith. He's got the gift of the evangelist, the gift of exhortation. So some people, God's gifted to exhort and to encourage and to exhort the people of God into action. Have you ever known somebody that, that when you get around them, you leave encouraged to be the person that God has made you to be? It's an exhorting kind of a gift. Gift of faith. All of us have a measure of faith. It's by it's by faith that, that we that, that we're saved and, and faith and grace that, that we're saved. All of us have some faith, but but God does seem to impart some people with this gift of faith where in spite of the circumstances they have the ability to see and to believe for God to do big things moving forward. A gift of faith, a gift of giving. Now once again, God called all of us to give. Being generous is one of the marks of taking on the character of Christ. Jesus, we saw a couple of weeks ago, the ultimate giver, all, all to be generous. But God does seem to impart kind of a gift of giving onto some people. And that can kind of look in like one of a couple of things. Some people, it seems, as though God has supernaturally gifted them to make money. Have you ever known someone like that? That everything they touch turns to gold. You can work, you can work your butt off, but they're always going to make more money than you. Have you ever known someone like that? And so, but someone with a gift of giving recognizes that God's given them this ability to make money, and it's not primarily so they can raise their standard of living, it's primarily so they can raise their standard of giving. And they get great joy in giving, and God uses them to, to fuel and to fund His mission moving forward, a, a gift of giving. It can also look like this. Some people feel, feel called into kind of a voluntary poverty. They may not make a ton of money, but 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 they're always going to give a, a large percentage of what they do make away to, to fund the kingdom of God. We see that early in, in the early church, how people were selling everything they had, kind of this voluntary poverty, a gift of giving, a gift of healing. It's all, all of us should pray for people when they get sick, but some people have, have get great joy in that, great passion for that, and many times God answers their prayer and people are healed. It was probably about seven months ago, it was right around, it was Christmas week, and, and that week I, I, it was on a Sunday after church, and, and I had developed this pain on, on my side that was consistent with appendicitis. We were going to be going out of town a couple of days later, I didn't want to be traveling and sick, and so I, I, it was all the doctors were closed because it was Sunday, so I, I went to the urgent care, and, and I was told I was going to wait four hours there, so I went ahead and went down to the ER. And uh, they did a CT scan, and, and they came back and said, here's the good news. The good news is you don't have appendicitis. The bad news is you've got this incisional hernia where I'd had a previous surgery and it never healed that you're going to need to have taken care of at some point. And they said, and there's this mass on your side that is probably scar tissue, but it might be lymphoma. Merry Christmas. And so, uh, and they said, don't panic, but you need to have this checked out. And so my, my doctor did a follow-up test. They saw that, that mass there. They saw that hernia there. And they said, hey, we're going to watch this and do another test in a few months. And so it was a few, uh, about a month ago, a month and a half ago, we were having one of our worship nights. People were praying for one another. And, and I knew that there's a group of people that, that at least some of those people have kind of this gift of healing, that, that, that they love to pray for people to get well, and many times they do. So I gathered up a handful of these folks, asked them to pray for me. And then when I went and got that test, the, the following week they came back and the doctor said, hey, your hernia is gone. And I said, uh... I said to those, I said to the doc, and this doc's an interesting fellow, I said, I said, do those things get better? And he said, really, never. Those things never just get better. But yours is gone, and we can't find that mask anymore. It was, uh, it was incredible. And so, uh, so if you need me to point you to the people to pray for you when you get sick, I can do it. And so, uh. We'll talk about that interpretation of here in a minute. Uh, up on the, the top, we see some people have kind of a, a gift of knowledge. God will, will supernaturally impart to some people insight into a scenario or a situation affecting a specific group at a specific time or a specific individual at a specific time, a gift of knowledge or a word of knowledge. Some people have, have kind of a, an anointed leadership gift. Where, where, where they are, are just gifted to lead, to lead God's people forward to get 
things done. A, a gift of mercy. Now, all of us, as we grow in the character of Christ, Christ was merciful. We're all going to have some mercy, but some people have a great gifting here, and that, that when they hear of someone that, that is in, in, in a tough situation or is hurting, they just hurt with them, they feel it deeply, and then they, they respond in action. They come alongside and help. Gifts of mercy, gifts of miracles, it's kind of like gifts of healing. So what, what you'll see sometimes in the New Testament is in one passage, a gift will be described like this. A, a gift of healing in another passage might be called a gift of miracles. That, that could be two separate things, or it could just be two names for the same thing. Uh, um, some people are gifted and, and really called. They just they are great at shepherding people and caring for people. Uh, but, and Pastor Tom's got a, a great gift on his life to, to, to really just care. Sometimes a great small group leader will be someone who just loves to have a group of people that they say, man, I'm going to watch out for them, and, and I'm going to be kind of take on, kind of helping them take next steps in, in their walk with Jesus. Those people can make great small group leaders, great care group leaders. They, they really have that kind of shepherding gift. Some people kind of have a, a prophetic kind of a gift where, where, where God will, will, will give them a word for an individual or a group. Not so much like foretelling the future usually, although sometimes, but, but, but it may be just kind of a directive kind of a word. Now, the thing about any kind of prophetic kind of gift is you always want to measure it against the Word of God. And if it doesn't line up with really what the Word of God teaches and what Christians have, have always believed, then, then you, you take the Bible and you say, hey, you might have just had too many chili dogs last night. I'm going to go with the Bible. And, but God does give people kind of prophetic words. Some people have gifts of help. Or, or serving kinds of gifts, or they get great joy in just doing practical acts of service. I, I think about, about Ruth Moore, who's over there kneeling as she takes care of some of our lights. And, uh, and then you think about gifts, people with a kind of a serving kind of a gift that they don't usually like a lot of attention. So when you have everyone point at them, they kind of hide in the dark. And, 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 uh, and so, did you know that after, after every service, Ruth walks up and down each of these aisles. And because some of you leave your coffee cups on the ground, because your mama never taught you, and, uh, and, she, uh, and, um, and so Ruth goes along and picks it up and throws after each service every week. She's got a gift of help. There's a ton of people like that that, that serve on our setup teams, our catering teams. It's a, it's a big deal. They, uh, they just they see a need, something that just needs to be done, and they get joy in practically getting it done. Some people have a great teaching gift. Once again, Pastor Tom, he, he's, more, he's, he's a teacher. He, he loves to teach the Bible. Some of you, and I think Vicki York, who, who gives some leadership to our ladies' ministry. Man, you sit her down and have her talk about the, the book of Revelation, and she'll just teach that stuff for hours and hours and hours. A teaching kind of a gift. We'll talk about all the tongue stuff here in a minute. And then the, kind of the word of wisdom, which is not unlike the, the, the word of knowledge, but it's like God just supernaturally imparts wisdom of, of this is the right thing to do at this time. I like this. When we look at tongues, we really see three different ways in which that's used in the New Testament. One is like a gift of languages. We see that on the day of Pentecost. The, uh, you know, there's people from all over the known world, but they're all understanding one another. You'll see that you'll hear about stories like that. People on the mission field that, that go to a place and maybe they don't so much know the language, but they're able to understand or to communicate with people that otherwise they may not know that language. Kind of a gift of languages. And then we see in the New Testament what, what we could call kind of a private or personal prayer language where, where someone just in, in privately communicates with God in a language that they don't understand. We see that in the Scripture. And I, I, a ton of people at Life Church kind of operate in kind of a private, personal prayer language. Many times their own personal prayer closet, them and the Lord. And then you see kind of what, what's called tongues and then with interpretation of tongues, which is this other gift where, where, where sometimes in an environment somebody will, will speak a, a, a word in an unknown language and then somebody else We'll, we'll stand up and, and we'll, we'll sit down and, and be able to interpret that tongue. And then it becomes kind of like a prophetic kind of a word. And then once again, you measure it against the Word of God. And, and so this is a giant snapshot. You say, well, that was overwhelming. Well, that's why we're doing this for the next five weeks. This was supposed to confuse you. 
you are welcome. And so, uh, let's keep going. So it's important to know about spiritual gifts. Here's the next thing. Spiritual gifts point people to Jesus. Look here, verse 3. What's going on here at Corinth? There's a lot of gifted people, but it's kind of going crazy, kind of getting nutty. They're placing this kind of overemphasis. They're not operating in, in the right way. And what's happening is many people are using their gifts to point to themselves. And what Paul says, he says, no, no. Spiritual gifts point people to Jesus. Look here, verse 3. He says, therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking in the Spirit of God ever says Jesus is a curse. And no one can say Jesus is Lord except in the Holy Spirit. What Paul's doing here is he's kind of elaborating what Jesus says in, in John chapter 15. Keep a finger in 1 Corinthians 12. But Jesus tells us in John chapter 15 that the Holy Spirit will point us to Him. John 15, 26, Jesus is referring to the Holy Spirit here and, and kind of comforter or helper. It's this word um, paraclete, which means kind of to come alongside. He says, but when the helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. The Holy Spirit points people to Jesus. And, and so, so that's why God gives us these gifts, not so much to point people to us, but to point people to Jesus. Spiritual gifts, is what they do, and, and so what Paul's saying, and he's saying, hey, hey, listen, when someone's speaking of the Spirit, they're, they're going to point to Jesus. If they're not pointing to Jesus, it's, it's not the Holy Spirit. And so what these spiritual gifts do is they remind us that Jesus had a mission and He's invited us to join Him. Jesus said, I have come to seek and to save the lost. And now He's given us that same mission. And so spiritual gifts remind us not only that, that God has called us to join Him on mission, but the Holy Spirit now is equipping us to join in on the mission of God on earth. Here's the third thing. The spiritual gifts lead to unity because they reveal how much we need each other. Look, look here at verse 21. It says, the, and so what Paul's going to do is he's going to use this analogy, like if the church is a physical body, then each gift is like a part of the body. And so here it goes. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Nor again, the head to the feet, I have no need of you. See, most Christians believe one of two lies when it comes to the church and other Christians. They either believe that I don't need you, or they believe you don't need me. So what many people do is they have this pride that says, hey, because I'm all that, I can live this Christian life, just me and Jesus, and so I don't need to prioritize my connection with the local church. I don't need to prioritize living in real Christian community. I don't need to prioritize allowing people to use their gifts to serve and to help and to bless and to edify me. I don't need you. And what Paul says is he says, that's about as stupid as your hand talking to your eye, which is remarkable to begin with, but your hand talking to your eye, your hand sprouts a mouth, talk, but oh, your hand can't talk to your eye because he can't talk because he has no mouth. So your hand talking to your eye saying, I don't need you. He said, that's what it is when we don't prioritize the local church, living in Christian community, allowing others to come alongside and serve us, help us, edify us, make us better. That's what it's like. We're saying, I don't need you. And then, the other lie that many people believe is that let this say, and you don't need me. So if two-thirds of the year, I'm at the lake, not at church, well, really, I'm only at the lake a third of the year because I'm on the sea slope the other third of the year. And, but that still leaves 17 Sundays to come, and I'm sure I can really make a big difference, though. That's ridiculous. Right? You guys get... And so, what, is, what I'm saying is you don't need me. And so whether I'm there or not, you're going to be fine. Whether I'm in my life group or not, you're going to be fine. Whether I'm using the gift that God's given me on a ministry team or other opportunities to service, to bless, to edify, I'm saying, you don't need me. And what Paul's saying is that that's as ridiculous as if you chopped up the different pieces of your body, scattered them on the ground, and then, ex then expected them to function as a healthy body. Only a chicken can do that. For a little while but not even for long. 
and that some people were grossed out. Um, here's how I know that some people believe that lie. Forty years ago, if you were to talk to any church leader, the definition of a faithful church member was they, they went to church four times a month on Sunday morning, four times a month on Sunday night, and four times a month on Wednesday night. And now, if you were to ask a church leader, how do you define a, a faithful church member? They'd say, oh man, if someone comes three times a month on Sunday morning, then that's what we call them. And listen, I went to my fair share of terrible Sunday night services. And there's a reason we don't do that. One of them is the school won't let us in, everything, but other than that, I went to my fair share of terrible Sunday night services. But, but, what, but what I'm saying is, is that if I recognize that you need me and I need you, then I'm going to prioritize the large group gathering on Sunday morning. I'm going to prioritize being plugged into Christian community in a life group. I'm going to prioritize my, my role on a ministry team. I'm going to prioritize those things because I recognize that I need you and you need me and we need each other. And so what that does is it leads to unity when, because they reveal how much we need each other. Asaph, or Aesop, depending on where you're from, of Aesop's fables said it this way. One day it occurred to the members of the body that they were doing all the work and that the belly was having all the food. So they held a meeting and after a long discussion decided to strike work until the belly consented to take its proper share of the work. So for a day or two the hands refused to take the food, the mouth refused to receive it, and the teeth had no work to do. But after a day or two, members began to find that they themselves were not in very active condition. The hands could hardly move, the mouth was all parched and dry, while the legs were unable to support the rest. Thus they found that even the belly, in its dull, quiet way, was doing necessary work for the body, and that all must work together or the body would go to pieces. That's what Paul's saying. Paul's saying we need each other, and then he gives us three reasons that we need each other. Look here at verse 21. He says, I, I can't say I have no need of you. Verse 22, on the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. So what Paul is saying is that every single one of us have a part to play, and the part that we play matters. They all matter the same, and they're indispensable. Say that with me. I am indispensable. I am indispensable. This church is not going to operate well and to be all that God's called us to be without you using the gifts and abilities that God has given you. You are indispensable. And on those parts, verse 23, that we think less honorable, we bestow the greater honor, and our unrepresentable parts are treated with greater modesty, which our more presentable parts do not require. But God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the parts that lack it. What, what, what Paul's saying is that, hey, some of you think that certain gifts are the ones that really matter, and that these ones really don't matter. And what Paul's saying is, hey, you know what? Man, God looks at those kind of hidden parts, those parts that don't get all, all the publicity, those parts that aren't as much up front, those picking up cups and all the aisles. And, and he says, and God says, and those, those get the greater honor. He's saying every, every part matters equally, everyone has a part to play. So why? So that there may be no division. See, see, the fact that I need you and you need me and that all of our gifts matter equally, it brings this unity because we know that we need each other. And that the members have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. We are in this together. So it reveals the truth we need each other. One, because all gifts matter equally. Number two, because no one has every gift. Look here at verse 27. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, gifts of healing, helping, administrating in various kinds of tongues. And then Paul asks a series of rhetorical questions. Are all apostles... Are all prophets, are all teachers, do all work miracles, do all possess gifts of healing, do all speak with tongues, do all interpret? Here's what he's saying. He's saying no one has every gift. Now, if you're a follower of Jesus, you, you have at least one spiritual gift. Now, you might have seven, but nobody has every gift. And no gift is for everybody. 
That, that's what Paul's saying here. He's saying, are all apostles? Well, no. Are all prophets? No. And do all have gifts of healing? No. All have gifts of miracles? No. Do all speak in tongues? No. So no one has every gift. And, and, and every gift, no gift is for everyone. Hey, right, listen. Man, if I was up here trying to strum a guitar and lead us in worship, none of y'all would come. You might come one just to laugh and to mock and to throw stuff at me. It would be terrible. No one has every gift. And, and, and no one gift is for everyone. And so what that does is it points out just how much we need each other. That we're in this together and that that's why God placed us together. Because we all have a part to play. We all have a difference to make. And when everyone is unified and recognize that I'm not doing this, it's not primarily about me. It's, it's about pointing people to Jesus. It's about the good of the church. It's about building up the church into maturity. It's about the kingdom going forth. It's about the kingdom being expanded. It's about cities being changed. It's about the Great Commission going into all the nations. It's about all that stuff. And that that's why God's brought us together and that we're better together. The kingdom goes forward together because when everyone is using their gifts to make the difference that God has called us to make. Little story and we're done. A certain mountain village in Europe several centuries ago, a nobleman wondered what legacy he should leave to the people in his town. At last, he decided to build them a church building. Maybe some of you have that anointing to build us a big, fine church building. And so, uh, no one saw the complete plan for the building until it was finished. When the people gathered, they marveled at its beauty and completeness, and then someone asked, But where are the lamps? How will it be lighted? The nobleman pointed to some brackets in the walls, and he gave to each family a candle which they were to bring with them each time they came to worship. Each time you are here, the area where you are seated will be lighted, the nobleman said. Each time you are not here, the area will be dark. This is to remind you that whenever you fail to come to church, some part of God's house will be dark. The bottom line is, we've been talking about this next five weeks, this is just an introduction, but what I want you to get today is that God has given you a gift, at least one, potentially multiple and that what you bring is indispensable. No one has every gift. Every gift matters equally. No gift is for everyone. And it's because of that that we realize how much we need each other, which leads to unity. It, it leads to love. It leads to caring for one another. So, I, you know what? Whether, whether you've been studying spiritual gifts for decades or whether you're newer on your faith journey and this is really the first time you've ever even heard of this. You've never even heard of it. And I believe all of us in the weeks to come can take next steps and, and, and growing and discovering how God's made us and how He wants to use us to make a difference. Let's pray together. So Lord, we love You. And God, we're grateful that You have given us gifts and abilities empowered by Your Spirit that we might join in on Your activity here on earth. God, we thank you for that. Pray that we'd use them to the max, Lord, that we'd remember that these gifts unify us. They show us how much we need each other. In Jesus' name, amen.